Uh, but I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to this breakout session. We're uh, a panel of uh, self-anointed uh, experts here, you might say, uh, with a variety of industries represented. Um, uh, my name, and I'll serve as moderator for this uh, about an hour and 15 minutes or so uh, session, is Dave Gooden. I'm a president and CEO of a company called MDU Resources Group, Inc. And uh, this part of the world, you may not recognize that name readily, but if you're doing some transportation up and down the highways, you maybe see some of our branded uh, Knife River uh, trucks in certain uh, construction zones. We've kind of sprinkled Montana with, uh, oh, we're from Missoula to Belgrade to Bozeman to Billings, and then, and then we do, so we do construction activities. We've actually been in the Bakken, we'll be there 90 years next March. So we've been an organization that's been around for a while. We also are on the utility business. In fact, that's where we got Origin started, uh, right in western North Dakota, kind of in the heart of the Bakken. So uh, I don't know if that gives us uh, authority or expertise to talk with some knowledge of the Bakken, but certainly we've been there kind of long before I was ever called the Bakken. Maybe just a little bit about MDU resources, and then what we're going to do here is I'm going to introduce all of our panel and ask them to talk a little bit about each of their organizations and how they view the Bakken as really a broad economic driver and then how can Montana leverage that uh, because it is really uh, in visiting with folks uh, whether it be as you know nearby as Billings or, or closer there is certainly a ripple effect there. So we are in the utility business we're seeing tremendous growth there we're also in the pipeline business so you'll hear about that a little bit and we're also in the construction services and no less we're also in the ENP business so we have some active drilling going on not to the level that you'll hear from uh, blue with uh, continental undoubtedly but uh, clearly we all understand what a great resource the Bakken is and so that's just a little bit about Dave Gooden and MDU Resources. We've been in the Bakken area for coming up on 90 years, and we kind of do a whole host of things. Uh, I want to introduce our, our panel now, and, and uh, after I do so, then we'll come back to Tim, and he'll talk a little bit with uh, Tudor Pickering Holt. But uh, Tim Salser is actually a graduate of this institution. He uh, is a vice president with Tudor Pickering Holt out of their Denver office, uh, and he will share a perspective because they've been very involved in a lot of the M&A activity up in the, the Bakken area. Uh, Duane Ray is with uh, president with uh, Spectra Energy uh, Liquids, uh, pipeline uh, expertise there, and clearly uh, very involved with the various uh, elements within the Bakken on how to get some of those products to market. Uh, Raheen Rashid, uh, close, uh, he's with uh, FBR Capital Markets, and certainly as an understanding about all the capital intensive opportunities within the Bakken and, and the amount of money inflowed on investment there and get a little idea uh, as that as well. Uh, next to Raheen is uh, Jennifer Stramans. Uh, I know Jennifer because uh, Jennifer and I are co-putting up the only refinery in 37 years in uh, the United States right in the heart of the Bakken, and I'm sure Jennifer will talk about that and maybe some other things that Calumet Specialty Products is doing. And then on the end is Blue Halsey. Blue is uh, Vice President of Gover Governmental Affairs with Continental Resources. Uh, Continental has clearly got a major position within the Bakken and uh, seen as one of the major players there as well. And so what we've got before you is some incumbents in the Bakken, some advisors within the Bakken, some M&A activity, some pipelines, some refining, some financial markets, and some oil and gas development. And so the goal here is to share information. So I'm going to be quiet in just a moment. We'll get Tim up here. We'll have some slides. We want to allocate as much time as possible for a Q&A session so that you can understand the broad driver in economics that the Bakken's producing well beyond the oil producing region. And so with that, uh, Tim. Well, thank you, David. And as David mentioned, I am a graduate of Montana Tech. And in fact, <clears throat> I took several physics courses in this room. And I can promise you, it was never been this full. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, at, at Tudor Pickering Holt and Company, we are a, a full service energy investment bank. We focus solely on energy and it's not always clear exactly what investment bankers do. And so I'll give you just a quick corollary. We're a lot like a real estate agent. When you're trying to buy or sell a house, we know the market and we, we line up buyers and sellers. And we've done, um, in the last three years, since the beginning of 2010, we've advised on 11 of the $22 billion of M&A activity in the Bakken. Um, you, this map just kind of orients everyone. We're always, we're always big on maps in the, the oil industry. But, you know, oil plays, resource plays have been, you know, incredibly active over the last three years, especially with the, um, you know, dip in, in natural gas prices and the stability of oil prices around, you know, $85, $90, $100. Uh, you can see the Permian Basin, we'll talk a little bit about here, and the, and the Eagleford are two of the bigger plays along with the Bakken. <clears throat> it's interesting that North, North Dakota has been vaulted to number two, the second largest oil producing state in the country, which is truly remarkable. And it's interesting if you would strip out um, the Texas uh, Permian Basin and of course, uh, you know, the Eagleford, uh, North Dakota would be every bit as large. Uh, certainly Alaska has been on decline for several years and you know the issues with with doing business in California make it um, you know two on decline. Uh, Montana ranks 12th overall and it's been the Bakken that has sort of sustained production in Montana over the last uh, few years and in fact you're starting to see even a little bit of growth in oil production in Montana. So the big three liquids plays dominate the resource M&A over the last year and a half. So this is uh, just deal count by resource play in the United States. Uh, and you can see that the Permian, Bakken, and Eagleford have dominated those. Uh, you see places like the Marcellus, the Haynesville, uh, the Barnett, traditionally gas resource plays. Um, you know, not making up near the activity that you've seen in the Bakken, Permian, and Eagleford. And when you look at it on an M&A volume amount, so amount of money just spent on assets, this is not the, the capital to develop these assets, but it's just purely the, the payment you make to acquire the assets. The Bakken uh, in the last year and a, and a half have had over $10 billion of activity. And for those of you who heard Delta Airlines uh, CEO talk this morning, that's about a year's worth of, of oil or, or uh, jet fuel that they that they purchase at about thirteen billion dollars. So it's interesting the uh, the massive amount of activity in the Bakken. The other really interesting thing is we see this theme throughout uh, plays in the U.S. is that the dominant buyer of assets are people who are already in the play. They continue to get bigger, more you know more scale. Uh, more efficient and drive down costs and increase margins. The Bakken especially has been a massive consolidation play over the last year and a half uh, with over 90% of buyers being companies already in the play. And we'll see that, that the big companies continue to get bigger in the play. So this is top Bakken producers. You can see Continental, uh, who blue here is on the, on the, uh, the panel with us today, is the largest producer of, of crude oil in the Bakken, and they continue to acquire and continue to gain scale. Uh, most recently, um, Kodiak Oil and Gas made a $660 million purchase of a private equity backed company. Uh, Oasis Petroleum made a $1.5 billion acquisition just in the last month of a privately held company. And Whiting Petroleum purchased uh, some, some private company assets for about $260 million. Those have all happened here in the last uh, couple of months. But again, it's just, you know, those big players getting bigger. And it's, you know, it touched, you know it's just one of those things of, you know, who are, who are busy in the play, who are doing things. It's, it's um, you know, it's these guys that really drive the upstream uh, piece of the play. The final thing that I'll say is the Bakken has, has had tremendous year-to-date equity performance. You can see these green names at the top of the play, or at the top of the page, all have significant Bakken holdings. 
And so if you were an investor on January 1st of, of this year in any of these companies, your dollars would be up 25 to nearly 50% as compared to, you can see to some of these other industries, you know, be at WTI spot, which has been up just 17%, you know, the financials, et cetera, um, you know, materials up about 10%. So the Bakken has truly been a, you know, continued success both in the M&A market and, and really playing out in equity performance. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Dwayne? Oh. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm the pipeline guy on the panel, and uh, contrary to Ambassador Doerr's best wishes, I'm not here to announce a Crown Royal pipeline into Montana. <laughs> <laughs> But do we, we do have the opportunity here today to talk about the tremendous changes underway in the economy in Montana, in the general region, and in North America. Now, the resurgence in the U.S. economy uh, is in large part due to the advent of unconventional oil and gas production. The revolution in, in unconventional gas production has been a huge boon to the North America economy, bringing lower heating prices, lower uh, 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 electrical generation costs, lower feedstock costs for petrochemical industries and other industries that are bringing manufacturing back home into, uh, into the U.S. from overseas. Uh, Spectre Energy is one of North America's largest <coughs> energy infrastructure companies, has been a, a, a beneficiary of this as well, as we're, uh, we've had about $25 billion in investment opportunities arising from uh, the advent and the, and the fast growth of uh, unconventional gas across the continent. So now, today it's unconventional oil that's making a big splash, and the Bakken is, is a big, big part of that. You know, uh, I think unconventional or Bakken production is now uh, close to 900,000 uh, BOE or barrels of oil equivalent a day, and uh, will probably surge to somewhere north of 1.3 uh, uh, million barrels of oil equivalent a day sometime in the coming decade. Uh, the Bakken is part of a larger trend where uh, unconventional oil, that being shale oil and oil sands, is displacing expensive and unreliable. Uh, offshore imports of crude oil. Uh, Aspect Energy, we saw this big uh, growth in unconventional oil production. We saw it was occurring in places that weren't well served by, by uh, infrastructure, by energy infrastructure. And we saw that as something that looked pretty familiar because what's going on on the oil side of the business is pretty much exactly what happened on the gas side five years ago. So we saw that as an energy infrastructure company who has a long, long history, uh, up to 100 years, in the gas side, we had to get into the oil side to be a player because the opportunity was just too large. So that meant that uh, earlier this year, we acquired the Express Platt pipeline system, and, uh, and that was our first foray into the crude oil side of the business and a springboard for our growth in, in crude oil infrastructure. Uh, the, Express, the Express Platt system is a 1,700 mile pipeline. It takes uh, uh, Canadian crude into Montana uh, and through Montana uh, to serve the Rocky Mountain refining base. Some of that crude stays on the pi pipeline attached to our Platt pipeline and then is joined by large volumes of back Bakken crude to, to go to the Midwest. So. Um, Express is the largest pipeline feeding those the Rocky Mountain refineries. It's also uh, the Platt pipeline is the largest pipeline from the Rockies into the Midwest. Uh, the Bakken pipe or the Platt pipeline itself, uh, it is uh, largely filled with Bakken crude. Uh, the crude comes through the, uh, the the Butte pipeline starting in in Baker, Montana, and connects to our system in Guernsey, Wyoming for ultimate delivery to the Midwest at uh, Wood River, Illinois. From Wood River, it serves the Midwest refining base as well as it's attached to barge and rail in Illinois and continues uh, off to the Gulf Coast. So we have Bakken crude, large volumes of Bakken crude, reaching both the Midwest and the Gulf Coast through our system. Of course, there's no shortage of Bakken crude re reaching the, the East and West Coast these days as well. But that's primarily through rail. Uh, the tremendous growth in unconventional oil production in, uh, in North America has been a real benefit 
to the United States as a whole. Uh, this year, we saw light crude imports into the Gulf Coast refining complex effectively stop. There is so much light crude production, and on the Gulf Coast it's largely come from the Permian and the Eagleford, that it has really displaced all those offshore imports of light crude. There's still heavy oil being imported from places like Venezuela and Mexico. But, uh, uh, but that will begin to diminish as well as more of the heavy, heavier grades of North American crude flood into those markets. Uh, you have on the Gulf Coast, it's the largest, most sophisticated refining complex in the world. And here, it was already the most efficient refinery complex in the world, and now it's becoming that much more efficient now that it's got access to, to uh, uh, very inexpensive natural gas for fuel and very inexpensive uh, crude oil for, uh, for feedstock. So a really good no news story there. We're seeing the east and the west coasts now being uh, uh, getting access to domestic crude, and a lot of that is Bakken crude. And that's really good no news from an economic, from a balance of payments perspective, from an energy security point of view. And it just makes those, uh, uh, those refineries that much more competitive in the, in the world markets. We've actually seen the United States turn from a net importer of refined products to a net exporter just over the last five years. And that's become, that is also helping the balance of payments. So now the growth in North American crude oil productions Lead, it, crude oil production is leading to a significant ramp up in crude oil infrastructure. And that should total about $80 billion worth of investment over the next uh, decade or so. Uh, nowhere is that growth more apparent than in the Bakken, where we've got the construction of, of gathering and transportation pipelines through the area, uh, crude oil storage, truck terminals, and especially rail terminals. The, this kind of hard infrastructure investment is, is, is very good for the local economy in, the, in Montana and North Dakota. Uh, these jobs are permanent jobs. They're not like drilling rigs. They're not like construction. Once these things are in place, they employ people long term. They, play, uh, they pay taxes, significant property taxes in Montana, I might add. And, uh, and as well, they uh, provide uh, low cost energy for local industry. So uh, pipeline, pipeline infrastructure investments are probably lagging the rail side, but they're, they're, they're coming too, and they'll, they'll come uh, as well. So I guess in, in essence, what we see is this, this ramp up in unconventional oil production, especially in the Bakken, is, is good. It's good for jobs. It's good for the economy. It's good for energy security. It's good for the entire country, but it's been very good for Montana and North Dakota. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Duane. Uh, uh, Rihan, we got, uh, I think we, yep, we've got it queued up here. Yep. We'll give you the mic. Okay. We're very smooth up here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Typically, this is the most stressful part of doing events like these. Can I get the presentation up and rolling? So, thank you for help there, David. Um, I'm probably going to just take some cues from, from um, the conversations we've heard so far. Um, um, and just to start off with, I, uh, um, Channel 6 stopped me outside and asked me what brought me to, to the economic summit. I made up with some good answer, but the honest answer is, you know, was it a bar in D.C.? That's kind of where our firm is based out of, and ran into Spencer Gray, and here I am two weeks later. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, Spencer and I used to work together a little while ago. That's kind of what brought me, brought me to this event. And um, so yes, um, uh, I, I am, um, my name is Rehan Rashid. I work with FBR Capital Markets. We focus on a lot of different industries, including energy. And I head up the energy research, energy, energy equity research there, um, and, and focus more on the oil and gas producers, so the continental resources, the whiting, all the, all the kind of ENP names that you hear about, um, uh, definitely involved in um, recommending to investors uh, where and which companies to focus with. Um, so I talk to your pension funds, your hedge funds, and, and kind of act as a consultant to them essentially um, as to um, which equity investments, public equity investments, uh, make sense. Um, so I thought I'd start off with um, the price in, in terms of, and in general, Bakken, not, not separating Montana or North Dakota, but generally speaking, kind of our, our thought is that uh, the, the base in the Bakken, rather, could, could um, and Three Forks combined, mm -hmm could um, <clears throat> result in an overall 
25 billion barrels of oil recovered and produced over the course of the next multiple decades. Um, and, and that's, again, um, tying into all the economic conversations that are relevant. Uh, I don't need to kind of elaborate further how, how big this number is and how important this is. In context, uh, from 1900 to 2008, call it, uh, total U.S. onshore production cumulative was about 160 billion barrels. So uh, definitely uh, Bakken will play a very significant role in the future uh, for U.S. Um, oil production outlook. Um, I'm, I'm an accountant by training, so I have to have lots of charts and graphs here. But maybe a kind of centrality of logic here. The next question comes up as, okay, fine, uh, the industry might have. They're still trying to figure out whether there's upside or downside to that 25 billion number. My bet is there's more to it than that 25 number that we're working with right now. But what that, does that mean for production? And, and you heard um, Duane mention 1.2, 1.3 million kind of number. On the bottom right-hand chart, uh, that's about kind of our Bakken outlook. We are roughly 1.5 million barrels a day by about the end of the decade. But it's funny enough, um, history has shown a lot of analogies as to uh, why that number might make sense. So the dark line on, on this chart is um, RP ratio, um, 3P to RP ratio. And what we have seen is, for example, um, today if I know, or if I'm roughly estimated that 25 billion barrels of oil in place, uh, that's my 3P reserves, um, how would, um, how should production, or how would production grow? So if you look at historical analogy, maybe the best one is the Permian Basin on the bottom left-hand side. All we're trying to say is that there's a tension between NPV and IRRs for all the companies involved in the business. Uh, of course, to maximize NPV, um, you have to pull forward cash flows as much as you can, meaning you have to pull, for, pull forward production as much as you can, meaning the incentive for technology is immense to collapse. Um, for example, not too long ago in the Bakken, an RP ratio or inventory of sorts that will last 400 years, which business wants a 400 year inventory, right? Mm -hmm. So all technology, all capacity is focused on coalescing all that and to collapsing the RP ratio. And what I've seen is, from all the um, historical um, analogies that I pointed out here, that um, nature and industry is kind of is kind of focused on coalescing that number to around or collapsing that number to about 30 year RP ratio. And if I use that, that's kind of how I get to about 1.5 million barrels a day by about the end of the decade um, as, as the kind of number for the Bakken production. <clears throat> um, of course, um, you've heard um, that the Bakken is not alone, so I, I figured I'd put, put this in a bit of a context. Um, so the box area, of course, is the um, rig average, um, average number of U.S. unconventional rig, rigs working in the different basins. And, and you can see um, that we expect Bakken um, um, to be about flat, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, about 185 over, over 1,000 kind of unconventional only um, rigs working. And again, this is a context as to how to think about the impact of tight oil um, in the U.S. In, in general, and tight gas as well, uh, immense amount of benefits. Uh, we've heard a lot about it over the last few years, and, and we'll continue to hear more of it, about it in the future. Um, again, numbers, but but want to focus on on the Bakken side. Roughly speaking, this year, um, this is ENP drilling only capex, fourteen billion dollars. My good rule of thumb is um, between infrastructure, between everything else included, you need, add, need to add about twenty to twenty-five percent on top of that if you want to think about the impact on from a capex standpoint. Uh, in terms of what um, what the local economies will benefit from from this kind of spending, and then again in context of overall U.S., um, it is still a pretty meaningful number that's being spent on the aggregate tight oil and tight gas shale plays. Continuing to put it in context, roughly speaking, Bakken, 850,000 barrels a day this year, going to 1.3 million by 2017. The U.S. oil production roughly. Um, seven million barrels a day, and, and hopefully nine and a half million barrels a day by um, by 2017. And, and this, of course, balance of trade, everything else you heard all the speakers talk about this morning, uh, very very important for the country. Um, this is kind of interesting. So, um, if I were to go back towards the first slide I had shown you in terms of total recoverable resources from the Bakken, and the generic number industry is comfortable with using is about 12 percent recoverables, uh, meaning of the, let's make up a number, 100 million barrels of oil in place, the industry over the course of time will recover um, only 12 million barrels. Um, I find that is an unacceptable economic outcome. You cannot tell me you're going to leave, leave 88 million barrels times $100 per barrel 
behind per per unit per section and that's again fundamentally the role of technology to arbitrate what nature is not allowing in, in its own fashion and help accelerate everything so but just in context the US conventional recovery factors over the course of time averaged 40 percent and um, back in the talk is about 15 percent maybe a little bit more um, there's a lot of room to go to that 25 billion number that we talk about which is off of a 20, 12 percent recovery factor in my opinion, the Bakken states should play a very active role in incenting industry to do a lot of R&D right up front to figure out what is going to be or what could be the recoverable resources, huge impact on state planning, huge impact on a lot of different things that I need, don't need to walk you guys through. But if I can get comfort as a state, as an industry, as a participant, what the upper end of the recovery factors could be sooner rather than later, huge impact on planning for the next multiple decades. I get this question asked as to how, uh, by the investment community, as to how long could the U.S. maybe maintain uh, its shale competitive advantage that it has across the rest of the world. Um, no kind of scientific answers, but maybe just analogy. So on the conventional development cycle, the U.S. reached 2 million barrels a day in 1925. Just picking, picking that number randomly as being meaningful enough, the rest of the world reached that number by 1945. So I'm just going to pick, randomly speaking, 20-year uh, advantage is what the U.S. has. Um, that will definitely address a lot of budget deficit issues, a lot of other problems that, that is economically facing the country, but 20-year uh, advantage is, is a lot to regain a lot of the competitive edge that we have, that, that we can queue off of uh, this uh, immense amount of resources that we have discovered in the country. So with that said, um, Q&A later. Perfect. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, we'll move on now, and uh, Jennifer Stramans, again, who's President and Chief Operating Officer with the Calumet Specialty Products, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what, uh, what, what actually they're doing <coughs> and, and actually our organization is uh, partnering with. Great. Um, Calumet is new to Montana. Uh, Calumet Specialty Products is a publicly traded master limited partnership. We are a leading producer of specialty hydrocarbon products, which basically means we take crude oil instead of making just gasoline and diesel fuel, we make a lot of specialty products that are used in consumer, industrial, and automotive applications. Uh, we own and operate 11 small facilities located throughout the United States. Our company was founded in 1990 and we went public in 2006. We're currently a Fortune 600 company. Um, because we focus so much on specialty products, we've got almost 5,000 customers and 3,500 specialty products. So again, your normal refinery, you'd see these huge tanks full of crude oil and then gasoline and diesel fuel. We've got a huge tank of crude oil and then hundreds of small tanks for these 3,500 specialty products that we custom make for our 5,000 customers. Our production mix is about half fuels, half specialty products, and our gross profit mix for 2012 was 60% specialty and 40% fuel products. Um, the two families that started our business still control 100% control of our general partner, and our market cap as of 9-5 was $2.1 billion with 69 million common units outstanding. Calumet's been growing rapidly over the last two years. Um, we've done $1.1 billion in acquisitions over the last 24 months. And since going public in January of 2006, we've raised $2.5 billion in the debt and equity markets. As we look at growing our asset base, we're always looking for unique strategic opportunities. Um, our largest refinery is only 60,000 barrels a day. So again, looking at these small, unique assets. Um, our CEO and chairman of the board uh, recognized the Bakken as a growing opportunity for us. And about two years ago, approached MDU to help to partner with us to build the first grassroots refinery in the middle of the Bakken. And that's been a um, very, very, very beneficial partnership, I hope, for both sides, certainly for Calumet. Um, at, we've got $420 million in growth capex that we're doing across all of our facilities at this point in time, and our investment in the refinery in the Bakken is $150 million. Our focus is on safe and reliable operations. Several of our facilities have more than a million worker hours without a lost time incident. And for facilities our size, that can be between six and eight years. So uh, again, a very large focus on environmental health and safety. Um, from a cash flow standpoint, we had $405 million in earnings last year. So 
you know, we're not a big company, but we're growing. We've grown at about a 26% compounded annual growth rate um, since 2008. So a lot of growth still to come. And since people aren't really familiar with some of the specialty products that companies like Calumet make, we throw this slide up when introducing Calumet to new, um, new people. You can see everything. We like to say we make everything from Vaseline to gasoline. So we've got full lines of wax and, white and food grade white oils to uh, lubricating oils used in refrigeration oils, electrical transfer oils, a lot of specialty low temperature aviation fluids, passenger car motor oils, um, our solvents go into paints and coatings, and then um, full line of asphalt products and of course the fuel products. Our goal in 2011 was to have a asset in every, re in every shale play in the United States and we've been very successful in doing that. Uh, we've got three facilities located in the Shreveport, Louisiana area. Um, really, we've got a refinery in Superior, Wisconsin that we bought off of Murphy Oil when they decided they wanted to exit the refining space and this is a 35,000 barrel a day facility. Most recently, um, we bought a refinery in the middle of Eagleford in San Antonio from New Star and we're doing a large expansion there. We paid $100 million for this asset and we'll invest another 50 in it over the next two years. Our Great Falls, Montana plant um, we, that we acquired from Conacher Resources in October of 2012, so we're just nearing that one year anniversary. Uh, we're investing a lot of money in Montana. We paid a little over $100 million for this asset and we're working on a, almost a $300 million expansion project. We're going to be taking this asset from a 10,000 barrel a day refinery to 25,000 barrels a day. And some of the synergies with the plant that we're building in the Bakken uh, the plant in the Bakken will make diesel fuel and then um, naphtha, the top of the barrel, the light ends of the barrel will be sold as naphtha to the um, diluent market in Canada and the heavy part of the barrel will go or can go to this Montana expansion to make to further process into additional fuels and asphalt products. This expansion has started and we expect it to be done in July of 2015 uh, adding a little over 30 jobs at the completion and we'll have hundreds of contractors on site during the expansion so um, hopefully be a nice economic boom to the Great Falls area. And then here's some pictures of our Dakota Prairie refinery which is in the Bakken and you can see just some pictures of construction we're working on tank construction and laying the foundations for all the process units uh, because of the size of the facility, this is a 20,000 barrel a day facility um, and the availability of workers in North Dakota, we are working with a firm called Ventec out of Houston to put together a lot of the equipment uh, in a modular basis at their facility in Houston. Then we'll transport these modules to North Dakota to then be erected at the site. And this project is supposed to be completed late fourth quarter of 2014. And we'll just, North Dakota has just been very, very nice to work with from a permitting and regulatory standpoint. It's, it's been a real pleasure doing business out there as well as here in Montana. Um, some of the, I've already talked a lot about these expansions. Um, you know, the Great Falls expansion, again, is a $275 million project. It's due to add about $130 million of EBITDA to Calumet. Dakota Prairie, a $300 million expansion, um, will bring 70 to $90 million of EBITDA to the partnership. So these are all very high return projects. Um, we're also expanding several of our specialty assets as well and trying to um, do a project in Superior, Wisconsin to barge crude on the Great on Lake Superior. So trying to think out of the box and be creative and innovative and move products and, uh, and feedstocks around. And thank you for your time. Excellent. So uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Blue, you've got a presentation as well. Blue is uh, Vice President of Governmental Affairs with uh, Continental Resources. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can say we'll regress both literally and figuratively. We've been talking about processes and uh, um, the f finance side, but uh, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm not a geologist, but I do like to talk about rocks. And uh, so we, we're just excited 
Um, and I'm excited to have this opportunity. I was really excited when I looked through the program and saw that there was a, a program called uh, uh, Bottoms Up, Exploring Growth in the Montana Craft Beer Industry. Uh, I was upset it was the same time as this. Uh, I, I felt we wouldn't have anyone here. Uh, I don't know why you guys are here listening to us, and, and you could be drinking beer somewhere probably. Um, uh, so let's, we'll hurry up and get out of here quickly so I can catch the end of that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, before I do get started, though, uh, uh, Tim, I think, said it. We're, I'm a picture guy. Uh, EMP guys are just pictures. That's, that's really what we do. So all I have is just a lot of pretty pictures that we can talk about. But uh, before I do start, I do want to introduce a couple of guys. Uh, in Montana, you guys are here to talk about the growth of Bakken. You've got some excellent folks. Uh, Bill Witsit uh, used to be with Devon Energy. He's now uh, a uh, Montana uh, uh, he lives in Montana. He's a resident. He's a great friend and a good guy, a good asset for your state. Uh, if you need somebody after this is over, t Bill knows everything about uh, policy and politics and is a great uh, mentor and a, a friend and would be excellent uh, folks uh, for, to meet Bill and, and, and get to know him, as well as Dave Galt. Uh, Dave it runs your Petroleum Association. Dave is a wonderful guy and a great advocate for your, your association here in the state. So, uh, and, and many more, and that's, it's a little intimidating to talk about the Bakken when, when you've got a great uh, number of folks in this room that, that know a lot about it, uh, a lot about this. Uh, so, so we'll just kind of hit some things briefly. Um, and, and, uh, but I, do, I did want to notice the one thing I, I thought about when we're sitting here, uh, we're, we're talking about, we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of OPEC, and who would have believed that we're sitting in a room in Montana talking about American oil? Uh, 40 years ago. It's really an amazing, uh, really, it, it, to think about that uh, is, is an amazing process when we talk about the billions of, uh, billions of barrels of oil that is yet to be recovered in North Dakota and Montana. We, have, we are on a, uh, a journey uh, as Americans, as an industry, uh, that, that is really an exciting thing for us to do. We're excited as Continental Resources being a, uh, being a, uh, uh, very big in this, uh, in this play. Uh, this is, you're supposed to read and not believe anything that I say. Um, this, <laughs> this talks about the, the growth in the Bakken. We're, we're, of course, in Bakken, we're in North Dakota and Montana. Uh, we do have a, a, a little play we call Scoop down in Oklahoma. Uh, we've had some uh, triple R uh, increase. We started out as a small company. When I came, we had about 200 folks. Uh, we're now at about 800 folks and still growing. We've moved down in Bill's old building in Devon. And, uh, Devon moved in their beautiful new building, and we're, we moved down to Oklahoma City and have expanded. So uh, we've got a lot of things going on as a, as a company and, and are excited about it. Uh, a lot of people ask us, where, when are you coming over here? In fact, I've been in South Dakota having this same conversation. When's the Bakken coming down here? Where are we at? Uh, tell us when the rigs are going to move. Tell us uh, when the big growth is going to happen in eastern Montana. Uh, the, what we, we've talked about this a lot, uh, and this is a uh, somewhat tells you the, the thickness of the Bakken. Uh, we look at North Dakota, they've got really the deep end of the pool. Uh, it's just that simple. The, the deep end of the rocks are over in North Dakota. That, uh, that being said, you've got some great uh, resource in Montana. Uh, it, it's got to be uh, the regula regulatory uh, environment has to be right, tax environment has to be right. Uh, all of the environments have to be right here in the state to make this a uh, solid play for a long-term long -term development in Montana. Uh, that being said, we, we still as a company believe in development in Montana and think uh, we're going to be here for a while. Uh, but that's, that's really uh, gives you a sense of, of what we're talking about when we talk rocks. This is some of the things that we're really excited about at Continental is our, uh, our shelves. Uh, we believe the Bakken has um, uh, three, the, the Bakken and then your three fork shelves, one, two, three, and four, uh, have potential. Uh, we, uh, we talk about, and you can kind of see uh, hypothetically, here's your line, uh, and you can see where that would be on the, the shallow end. So you've got this large end of, of, of resource, and we believe that each one of those uh, has a producing value, um, that each one of those benches you will be able to, to drill laterals, uh, laterals in. Uh, this kind of gives you, we, we had talked about ultimate recovery. Uh, this is just a, uh, our shot first in, oh, perfect. In 2010, uh, uh, our first estimate, nobody, uh, this was, we, we, they thought we were kind of crazy, 24 bar billion barrels of recoverable. Uh, we still think these uh, second, third, and fourth benches, uh, we think there's, uh, that's 903 billion barrels in place. You look at recovery rates, uh, we were talking about 17% uh, recovery rate earlier. 
Um, you know, it just, uh, it is amazing when you talk about the pure uh, amount of resource in place. And that's another thing when uh, we're here to talk about how this grows in this state and there's so much technology growth that can happen because of this resource uh, in place. There's, there's a tremendous opportunity again on the, uh, on the start of what this means to, to not only Montana, but the entire United States. One of the things that I do also want to talk about on the development side is really uh, our move to pad drilling. Uh, a lot of it is what kind of impact are we having? Uh, how are we doing this in such, a, uh, in, in such a large scale? Well, it's by pad drilling. This is a site, we have 14 wells. This is south of the city of Williston. We have 14 wells on this one site. We, we've, able, we've been able to pipe in our water, our uh, saltwater disposal. We have a well on site. Uh, our electricity, our rig, this rig actually is an electric rig on, um, on Williston uh, utilities, which is kind of neat. When you drive up, if you've ever been on a rig site, you drive up and usually you hear some big engines and big generators and big things. Uh, actually, this you, you just hear the break on the uh, on the on the rig itself. It's pretty. It's it's actually really neat. Uh, and so this is a four section uh, area. We're drilling through four, fourteen of these wells are drilling through this these these sections. Four sections, one pad site. Uh, ultimately, we'll have we have the space to put fourteen more wells on that uh, on that pad. Uh, less than one acre, it'll be less than one acre per well site, uh, per, on the pad. So really a way to, to reduce our surface, um, uh, surface impact, uh, make it an uh, easier way to get to our sites and drill the resources we need to get, get to. Um, what, what I, one thing I do want to talk about, and we always, uh, uh, always talk about is uh, horizontal drilling versus we, we have a lot of hydraulic fracturing talk and, and what hydraulic fracturing has done to uh, to our industry uh, ultimately if we really want to talk about it it is a horizontal drilling horizontal drilling has changed the way uh, Americans think about oil and gas because we're able to go down 10,000 feet go out um, three miles we're doing three mile laterals in North Dakota what that does, these are old well bores, what you would do with vertical wells, hitting that um, just one little piece of that uh, producing um, segment. Now we're able to stay in that zone, produce that entire well. It's revolutionized, uh, the, the, revolutionized the way we produce hydrocarbons. It, it isn't hydraulic fracturing, it's been, it, it really truly is horizontal drilling has gotten us to this place. Um, just, just gives you a little, uh, sign of the red rig count you do have some rigs in this uh this was the last i'm not sure this was 9 12 i think uh that may change this is bakken rigs so your rigs may be different uh in the state but the bakken rigs are nine uh again we're uh you, you've got a lot more in north dakota but still you do have bakken rigs running in montana and, and a lot of uh, a lot of those industri industries that are off those those rigs um, this is just some historic data. Uh, you talk about the production. Again, you, you see this big spike, uh, and you're going you're gonna to have a larger spike here, uh, but you're still going to have growth in Montana production. Uh, your, your well counts are going to continue to grow, and your, uh, your production is going to continue to grow in this state. Uh, j just to, to uh, what does this mean to Montana? It means jobs. It means money. Uh, in taxes, it means resources uh, to this state for this state to, to grow and prosper. Uh, we're we're gonna you're gonna see uh, employment increase. Uh, your production is gonna increase. Uh, again, it has and it, and it will continue to increase uh, in the Bakken. Uh, your your money to from your um, your leases uh, and your tax revenues are all coming in. They're all gonna grow over the next uh, several years. Uh, all all benefit this the entire state. Uh, again, uh, money to uh, lease owners, um, royalty owners, uh, that's going to continue to rise. Um, and then this is just an uh, unemployment. What this renaissance is really doing to the United States, uh, our, um, our employment in this industry is going to continue to rise uh, and will be uh, ongoing for a long time. I think that's it. Great. Great. Okay, so we have a standing room only crowd. This is fantastic. I uh, wish we had a couple more chairs for you folks, uh, but thanks for uh, bearing with us. 
I too was a little concerned on that bottoms up uh, craft beering because he thought, you know, we're going to go head to head. But I said, I, we have confidence, you know. Let, let me summarize what I heard, then we want to open this up for some Q&A. And if you don't have one, I've got a couple softballs, but we want some hard, uh, fast cut balls at these folks. Uh, at, not at me, but these guys. Okay. <laughs> so, so what I, 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 what I just heard was we believe, we believe, you heard from, you know, financial markets, pipeline perspective, refining perspective, a production perspective, a perspective of an incumbent that's been there 90 years. The Bakken has most likely got some sustainability. It's probably one of the understatements that you're hearing here today. We heard upwards of 25 billion barrels of recoverable oil at some percentage of 15 percent maybe if you I mean pick you there is a lot of hydrocarbons trapped in that tight shale and so is it a sustainable and is it considered probably one of North America's largest construction projects I personally think the answer to that is yes and yes